I want to revisit where we've come from okay. um, because, uh, frankly, in going back to find photographs to remind myself of where we came, uh, came from in the pandemic, uh, you know, I knew all of this, but it was jarring actually to see some of the photographs from the beginning. So, Zach, do you okay. want to begin to show those and I'll describe them for people who are just listening. These are from March of 2020. Two years ago. Two years ago. Um, so uh, just to revisit, Heather and I were in the Amazon finishing the first draft of our book and heard about novel coronavirus for the first time as our phones came awake after uh, being in complete isolation where there was no service of any kind. So that was January. That was January. Um, so we returned and the story of uh, novel coronavirus, which became uh, SARS-CoV-2 and covid uh, marched on. So what this is a picture of here, some of you will remember that early Dark Horse episodes were not live streams. They were all uh, discussions between me and somebody uh, in person, and they were in a different place. Um, we built this studio into my office as COVID forced us out of the studio that we were renting in downtown Portland. And so this is a photograph. Not a moment too soon. <laughs> right. This is a photograph. Zach and I recaptured everything we could from the studio downtown in a mad rush. We were literally going into the building at midnight so we wouldn't interact with people because nobody knew how this thing spread and how dangerous it was. I think it was literally, I'm just looking at the calendar, like we are literally two years to the day from the last day that Zach was in school. The following day was Toby's last day of school. And then that weekend is when you guys right. uh, emptied out the studio. So the kids were thrown out of school mm -hmm. en masse. Zach and I took the Dark Horse studio and took every piece that would move and brought it home mm -hmm. um, and started going to the hardware store to get the kinds of things necessary to make the studio work. So all Like right. the interior of a sauna. Right, like mm -hmm. the materials from the interior of a sauna, mm -hmm. cabinets and the like. All right, so go ahead and hear an, an image. Okay, so at this time, there was <coughs> hoarding of, and I don't want to say hoarding. I think that's actually the wrong term. People mm -hmm. were stocking up on materials, yep. not knowing what was coming. And actually, I don't think they were wrong in this regard. We have mm -hmm. now seen supply chain issues. Yes, they were delayed. But of course, the idea that we were in an unstable situation and that one couldn't guarantee that staples were going to be available was very much in the air. I thought all the supply chain issues were due to Putin's invasion of Ukraine. Is that not right? Or? No, because of Time's Arrow. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. right. That's right. Also, it's funny how no one in the mainstream media seems to have noticed Yeah, that. the inflation also turns out to have been well underway before that invasion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, go advance. Uh, so that was beans that were uh, out of stock. Interestingly, people spotted that, uh, you know, black beans uh, were the right thing, but there were lots of other beans they left on the shelves. <laughs> that's um, true. Yeah, lentils were always, always right. consistently available, so that's actually. good to know. And actually, I, I didn't include a picture here, but I had a picture of the peanut butter section where people have not spotted just what a good staple that is. Mm -hmm. um, so you could buy peanut butter even if you couldn't buy beans. This is surprising to me. You got a whole bunch of Dr. Bronner's on the bottom shelf. That's Castile soap. That stuff saves forever. You can do it, use it for almost anything you want to clean. Yep. Huh. Yeah, no, the deeper you read into that bottle, the more things you discover it's good for. It's <laughs> right. uh, it works as There may be a little the evangelism there, but okay. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Dude was a little out there. Yeah. But, you know, here we got hand sanitizer has been uh, ransacked. Now, notice ransacked. Um, hand sanitizer didn't actually turn out to be important here, but we all thought it was going to be very plausibly so. Now, hand sanitizer is good stuff. And a lot of infectious disease that we spread around, colds and flu and the like, um, is likely very sensitive to it. So I, I don't resent the bias towards hand sanitizer that we have moved to. but. I, uh, we all remember the, uh, the craze around uh, isopropyl alcohol, which you couldn't get, and um, hand sanitizer, which turned out to be more or less irrelevant to COVID. Yep. Um, okay. Advance one more. Now here, this is a line out the door at the local gun shop, right? People were hoarding. Mm -hmm. Now, I got to find a better term. Mm -hmm. People were stocking up on guns and even more importantly, ammunition. And it was resulting in a store that would never typically have a line, having a line out the door. I wrote a little bit about this mm -hmm. uh, for Unheard, where I discussed the question of the Second Amendment and what role um, 
it, it may actually be playing. But anyway, that's the local gun store and the, the line that existed there. Can you go one more? And here you can see a wall of um, ugly duckling guns that people didn't really want. Um, but you can see how many spaces are empty on that wall. Mm. Right. As people are buying. Now, the thing that was really in short supply was ammunition. That's that's a wall that normally would have been um, full. Every spot would have had a, a gun and um, and it got it dwindled more than that. Mm -hmm. um, but it was it was the ammunition that that just simply wasn't available anywhere, much like hand sanitizer. OK, advance one more. All right. Now, here is why I was going back to look for photos. Um, I was one of the first people to mask in Portland. I was so early that I was the only person at the hardware store. Zach and I were getting materials to build the studio here. Um, I was going in masked with those are safety glasses with uh, a little bit of side reading flanges. glasses oh. in, in the yeah, and they have side flanges. Yeah. And I had a technique. And the basic idea was nobody knew how this thing transmitted at that point. It's true. It Everyone was talking about fomites and very right. high CFRs and all this. Yep. So it stood to reason that a mask was a good idea, even if nobody else was wearing them, maybe especially if nobody else is wearing them. It stood to reason that because many viruses do get in through your eyes, that having safety glasses on was a good idea. Um, and in order that they didn't interact badly with my reading glasses, I got the reading glasses built in. I also uh, used cloth gloves. You could buy a, like 10 gloves for five, 10 pairs of gloves for five bucks. And I would put them on, wear them while I was out. So while I touched things and then I would strip them off, I would actually early on strip off all my clothes when I got home and put on new clothes. So if this thing was transmitting on clothing, right, you and I had you, your discovery was that copper actually yep. is I, I covered our um, outdoor and indoor to outdoor doorknobs with copper tape. Copper tape. Because copper uh, is both an antiviral and antibacterial. Right. We had a policy that when And things, it looks nice. When, <laughs> when packages arrived in a cardboard box, as they all do, we would leave them sit for 24 hours because the evidence was that uh, infectious agents couldn't persist on cardboard for longer than that. So anyway, we had an elaborate uh, yep. routine that was based on the fact that we really knew very little about this pathogen. And one of the things- And we're trying to be careful. We were we were erring in the in the direction of being careful because we took this virus very seriously for reasons we will get back to later. Mm -hmm. um, but I think one of the things that I hope people will remember about us is that what what we really did and what got people's attention early on when we started live streaming your idea that we start live streaming from here was it? Yep, it was your idea. Um, so you're in good company. Joe Rogan suggested that I start a <laughs> podcast. You suggested that we, that we start live streaming. Yeah, well, we were sitting there. I do remember this. We were we were we were pulling our hair out about the public health pronouncements already at that point. They were so inconsistent. They seemed to be based on no data or patently absurd analyses. And I and yeah, I think I said to you something like, I really feel like we've got a lot that we can offer in terms of how to think through these things, even though even though and we knew this, and therefore we knew that there was uh, a substantial risk um, that we could have been really wrong on a lot of fronts. And you know, we were wrong on a few fronts, which well, you're about to get to. But you know, the basic basically the idea was we we approach the world scientifically and evolutionarily. And the the second is a subset um of of the first. And not everyone who has a scientific toolkit has an evolutionary toolkit. Uh, but boy would we love to be able to help other people use those toolkits to make decisions for themselves and to start tracking when it is that their own predictive abilities are getting better and better so that they can trust themselves more and more and rely less and less on external authorities who, oh, by the way, may have interests that do not align with yours. Okay. So I want to go back and refine one thing. Okay. You said we could have been really wrong. Okay. Not worried about wrong. Mm -hmm. We erred in the right direction. We erred in the careful direction. Mm -hmm. And we have done that from the beginning. And we did get some things wrong. Masks are one of the things I personally got wrong. Okay. But I got it wrong in the correct direction. And one of the things that I think you and I got um, the got attention that was very positive, and I hope people will remember, is that what we did was we started with a model that effectively assumed this thing could transmit any of the ways that these things transmit. Mm -hmm. And as data came in and it became clear that this wasn't fomite transmission, mm -hmm. that 
uh, there was something very important about the volume of air and the rate at which it was turning over so that it wasn't like you contact a particle and you get sick. It's like there's a period of time as a clock ticking and the air circulation and the volume of the room and how sick the person that you're talking to is all of them play a role. And so we built Density up a model. dependence at all of the at all of the stages of interface between virus and person. Right. And we, um, you know, we uh, used what we called, uh, you know, um, I'm now forgetting the term we applied to it, something like the uh, the real volume of the room or the, um, the effective volume. Effective of the volume. Room. Yep. Effective volume. So a car is a very tiny effective volume. Mm-hmm. You open the windows, the volume jumps. You go outside, the effective volume goes to infinity. Mass and- transit where you don't have an ability to open windows. You expect expect things to be bad. And I, I do think, um, you know, we, we never, as much as we were erring on the side of caution, uh, neither of us ever thought it was necessary or a good idea to um, be applying those kinds of measures outside. Outside, wow. we understood, and you know, I've, I found a I found a paper very early yep. that, that had come out of China very early um, that it looked that it tried to track the the origin of tens of thousands of cases. Sure it was China. Yeah, it was, um, and and it was um, there was I think only one case out of the tens of thousands yep. that they could actually track to an outdoor transmission, and it was a very very sick person talking at very close range loudly to his neighbor, if memory serves, and um, and effectively he was you know right <clears throat> the the recipient of the virus in that case was right in the funnel of you know an active infection, and you know that. I, I am I am very grateful that we weren't we weren't wrong on that because well, I, I think you're even being too cautious here, okay. right? Because I think the real story is mm-hmm. um, there was a an opposing force, right? There's this thing. I think the original is Rahm Emanuel, who once said, uh, "Never let a good crisis go to waste." Right, R- Rahm Emanuel being a democratic political gunslinger, effectively. Yeah. But I think what happened, the best case here. Right. The best case is that people took advantage of a crisis to accomplish things that they wanted to accomplish anyway, many of which are very much not in the public's interest. Mm -hmm. But I think you and I ended up on the opposite side of a conversation with an enemy we did not know existed. Right. Which were people who were using the pandemic for purposes. We thought as you know, as a normal person would, that we're all in this together. We're all faced with this virus and figuring out what to do about it is a project everybody should be involved in and people should be bringing whatever tools to bear um, that they have at their disposal. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think what actually happened is that as, you know, this thing wanted to create fear, right? It wanted to create fear And it had useful tools at its disposal that were also potentially in play with respect to controlling the virus. So it pretended uh, after it was clear in the data Mm -hmm. that the outdoor environment was safe, it continued to pretend that it wasn't because its purpose really wasn't about the virus. Its purpose was about um, controlling people. And so you and I became increasingly alarmed uh, as this thing insisted that the outdoor environment was a place that you needed to mask. And our point was there actually isn't any evidence of that. So Mm -hmm. as you and I developed uh, a model of how the virus functions, how it transmits, and what therefore we could relax about the many measures. I mean, remember, we're talking about going out with sacrificial gloves with uh, (laughs) with safety glasses with uh, a a mask right what of this can we relax because it's actually not relevant to the transmission of this pathogen at the same point you and i looked at the evidence uh and it was quite clear that there was something about the outside environment that was safe it was Mm -hmm. unclear initially whether or not it was safe at night because one of the reasons it might be safe was uv light Mm -hmm. right And so it became clear, actually, that there were two reasons it was safe outside. One was UV light, but that even at night, this was not transmitting outside. And so the point was, what we were doing was refining a model, starting with a very careful, overly careful response and refining it and relaxing it as uh, as as it became clear that you could relax it. And my point about the mask mandates, which ended today, is that we are watching 
that other thing which had other purposes finally having to admit mm. that it was being overly restrictive yeah we can talk about how we know that that's what's going on uh, a little later but i think that you and i actually forced the conversation to admit things like the outdoor environment isn't the same and to the extent that you're claiming that you want people masked for epidemiological reasons um you know, 99% of the world, more than 99% of the world is in fact safe. And you've got people believing that the world is 100% dangerous. Why would you do that? Yeah. Well, okay, a few things. One is I went back and found this paper, which was published in 2021, but I got the preprint from April 2020. You can put it up if you like, Zach. Um, I was wrong. It wasn't tens of thousands. It was um, a couple thousand um, cases that they that they were able to trace. Um, it was China, um, as I said, from from January and February. Um, so, you know, this is, this is extraordinarily early in what we are told, um, yeah. was, was when it was spreading. Um, so anyway, not, um, not as, as huge a data set as I thought, but still, still very large. Um, and then, you know, one of the other things, um, that, you know, we were thinking early on was, well, you know, homeless, the homeless population is going to be very at risk of this, unless, you know, the outdoors is protective. Yep. And sure enough, we've seen no, uh, evidence of super spreader events either, or, you know, or super spreader or just massive spread either within the homeless populations or among protests, right? And so again, people will remember, I think that by um, sort of April and May of 2020, there had begun to be protests by people um, objecting to uh, to lockdowns. And you know, mo I, as I remembered, it was mostly about lockdowns and it was mostly people um, who were identified by the mainstream media as being right of center, regardless of what their politics actually were, I don't know. Um, um, and these protests were decried widely, right? Like this, this was going to itself cause more spread of COVID and how dare these people, how selfish. And then within weeks of those protests, uh, George Floyd died and the protests, of course, erupted first, um, first in Minneapolis and then throughout the U.S. and then throughout the world, really. And there were just massive protests. You know, here in Portland, I think it was over a hundred consecutive nights of protests that then reliably became riots. And, um, and at that point, that over a thousand, I think, I think I do have that order of magnitude, right? Over a thousand health professionals declared that the real pandemic was racism and therefore these protests were not just justified, but actually necessary. Anyone who still thought that we were living in a world in which we were be get, being given advice based on data and not on ideology could pretty much conclude at that point that at least a substantial portion of the health policy and public health apparatus was completely out to lunch and you know not in fact doing what the job description suggests doing. Um, that said, as much as those protests, especially at the point that reliably in Portland and in some other places, they turned into riots every night um, during the summer and, and fall of 2020, as much as they were disruptive of an incredible amount of, of humanity and goodwill, um, they were not super spreader events yeah. any more than the protests uh, in the spring of 2020 against the lockdowns and, and such were super spreader events any more than um, there were there was a lot of transmission among homeless people and the common theme in all of of those is of course being outside yeah which we predicted actually at the right. point that uh many were saying you know we were talking about the blm riots and saying these are going to be super spreader events our point was we're not in favor of these riots as we've described many times but right it's not clear that these are a hazard in this regard right you and i went uh to see for ourselves we a few times yep knowing that the outdoor environment was likely to be safe, but being mm -hmm. concerned that this was highly concentrated and taking place at night where you didn't have UV mm -hmm. light as a disinfectant. Um, and there were people yelling, right? I mean, the yelling yeah, right. and singing, such as it was. Um, <laughs> yeah, toneless, but. Oh my God. Yeah. Um, but anyway, Dur you and I. Dirge like protest songs. Yeah, yeah. dirge like. That's being generous. But, um, but you and I behaved. 
<clears throat> exactly consistently with what we've described here, right? We believed it to be safe on the mm -hmm. basis that it was outside, and we knew what the evidence suggested about the outside. Mm -hmm. We knew that night was probably safe, but you and I kept moving so that if we mm -hmm. were downwind of somebody who was sick, we would not. We would have a high enough effective volume around us that we wouldn't contract the virus. So I think we now know that effectively, especially early on in the pandemic, it simply wasn't transmitting outside night or day, mm -hmm. um, that it would have been safe. But erring in the direction of caution is the refinement. We've done that and we have relaxed our approach as it has become clear that certain things are safe and other things are not. Okay, can you go to the next photo, Zach? Oh, there's you sporting the uh, chili pepper bandana. Yeah. Now I will say- That's my uh, that's my tropical bandana, that's what that is. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, as the pandemic continued, mm -hmm. it became clear. So I had initially thought that cloth masks uh, would be sufficient because the droplets that were being transmitted were large enough that they would be caught. It became clear that that- Do we need to keep that up? <laughs> uh, we can move on. Okay. Um, <laughs> It became clear that if masks were going to be useful at all, that it wasn't going to be cloth masks. So um, moving away from cloth masks uh, was a move in the other direction, right? Not masking outside was a relaxation. Moving to masks that were more likely to be effective uh, was a move in the other direction. But anyway, the point was we were developing a model. This is Zach and me in the elevator as we were disassembling the, the downtown studio. To close this out, I just want to point out we have traveled the full gamut, right? From as far as I know, me being the first person in our environment to mask at all, yeah. right? I was masking before, you know, this was a million miles from a mandate at the point that I started masking because yeah. it seemed likely to work. <laughs> I was resentful. Right. You, you were like, you, you're you going out to, you know, you, you put on a mask. I'm like, <laughs> right. I don't want to wear a mask. Right. But the point <laughs> is, you know what? When there was no evidence about how it transmitted, made sense to behave that way. As the evidence came in and it became mm -hmm. clear that cloth masks were ineffective, then if there was going to be a mandate, it should have been about masks that stood a chance of working. And at the point it became mm -hmm. clear that this was not an effective way of controlling the pandemic, we should have gotten rid of them because everything has a cost. And this one has a particular cost to children that we should never have been yes. willing to bear. In this case, there are some of the costs that we can absolutely see. And yeah. I remember... Oh, maybe, I don't know, six, 12 months ago, um, at the point that one of the associations for child psychology, I think it was, uh, came out publicly declaring that there was absolutely no impact on little children in like preschool interacting only with masked kids. And then separately, and I won't be able to call it up now, but, uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, the CDC quietly and without saying anything, um, changed the benchmarks for language development for young kids. And the number of words that kids are expected to know at various benchmarks has now gotten pushed back by six months in several cases. Why? Huh. I wonder what could possibly be going on in the world for the last two years that would cause all of the American children to suddenly get dumber. They're lowering the goalposts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Lowering the, yeah. Lowering the well. goalposts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So anyway, I, I think I think for the people uh, watching, it is worth thinking about what it takes to drive people who were as interested in figuring out what the best practices were to control this, um, this virus uh, as, I hate to say they've driven us crazy, but they've certainly made, they, they have... Uh, tested our patients remarkably by pretending that all of these measures have the utility they don't when the evidence doesn't support them. Yep. And, um, you know, it, it's been a profound, a profound transition.